Hey, good afternoon, class. Welcome in. Uh, this is going to be our second and actually final discussion on World War One. Like I said, we're bouncing from topic to topic. We're going to try to keep it short to the point uh, and understand that uh, we're going to be going through these rather quickly. So we left off talking about uh, each side kind of setting the stage for war. Okay, we had Armenia, right? Militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Well, now... <clears throat> Each of these combatants, each of these nations are going to get into the mix. Uh, they're going to fight, and this war, uh, many of which thought was going to be rather quick, is going to be uh, bogged down into a war of attrition. So that's what I titled this um, discussion as. And you can see um, just a, a string of uh, essentially troops who are using flamethrowers. Yeah, so new technology is being implemented. Uh, they're using flamethrowers for multiple reasons, and we'll talk about that as we get into this. But this war, again, unleashes um, these new technologies, these new new systems of war that uh, prove to be incredibly deadly. So let's get into this, and we'll go from here. Okay, so understand this. At the start of the war, uh, things were very open, and we, we, we had those old tactics meeting new technology with deadly results. Therefore, each side is really going to get themselves bogged down into the trenches. And trench warfare created a stalemate that led to a tremendous amount of lives lost. Commanders would often attempt to break these lines by sending troops over the top. Uh, here, they were met with heavy machine gun fire and barrages from the artillery. In between the trenches, again, trench one, trench two, not very far from one another on this battlefield. But in between them, you had what we call no man's land. And that's what emerged. All right, this midpoint is where a majority of the slaughter occurred, okay? You did not want to be caught in no man's land. If you were, uh, your life would definitely be uh, at risk. Now, in order to break the stalemate, we start seeing some new deadly inventions. The tank was invented in 1915 to destroy barbed wire and trenched obstacles. Early models were very faulty, very slow, very tedious, but could cause severe damage and could break stalemates in no man's land, okay? So all of a sudden, you're seeing you get everything on horseback starting to transfer into, you know, armored tanks. That's a different kind of ball game. Also within the trenches, again, people are living in these trenches. They are dug in. Uh, they're living months at a time. And in order to pry some of these folks out, you start seeing the implementation of poisonous gas. So chlorine and mustard gas was invented in Germany. These poisonous gases would pry the enemy troops out of the barricaded trenches. Gas masks, of course, were created to prevent gas from being inhaled. These gases would essentially get into the system, destroy the lungs, and choke out the combatants. Again, it was terrifying. Uh, again, not only is it chemical warfare, but it's also psychological warfare as well. Okay? Now, flamethrowers were introduced for the first time as well. These would clear out any troops stacked in these trenches and would also be used to destroy crops. As we know, again, destroying an enemy's logistical uh, supply line is devastating. If you're able to wipe out crops, if you're able to wipe out livestock with these flamethrowers, it prevents your enemy from uh, feeding themselves. And that in itself uh, is one of the reasons the flamethrowers starts becoming so prominent. So you have not only, again, flamethrower being used in close quarters combat, you also have flamethrower being used to destroy uh, the agriculture around these areas. Now, up in the sky, the first airplanes are being used during World War I. Planes would be used for really three main purposes. Scouting, all right, to scout and survey the area. Reconnaissance, all right, getting some information and returning it back to the home base. And then fighting. And you would start seeing actual fights in the sky. Imagine this. Again, flight had just started in 1903. So, you know, 12, 13 years later, all of a sudden you have two planes up in the sky going at it. And they would call these um, actions a dogfight, okay? And as you could imagine, again, mankind finding new ways to kill one another, they are starting to drop bombs and other heavy objects from the sky into the trenches where either it's going to explode or it's going to fall and it's going to kill uh, if it strikes someone down uh, at ground level. Again, as this is all evolving, later on, airplanes are going to be fitted with machine guns as well. Again, here's an example. This is the British fighter, the Sopwith Camel. All right. And again, that's a World War, I, World War I model that we see in our slides. Now, here's a good map that represents the Allied versus the Central Powers. So again, the Allies, in this instance, Great Britain, France, 
and Russia, okay? The Central Powers, the Ottoman Empire, which is Turkey, we have Germany, we have Austria-Hungary. And notice, uh, Germany is fighting a two-front war, and that in itself is incredibly difficult. On the Western Front, uh, they really kind of get bogged down right before they get into Paris, right before they get their approach to try to conquer. They are stuck in France, and they, and they also have to contend with the Russians on the Eastern Front. But that's not going to be as much of a worry uh, as we'll see here in just a moment. Now, understand this. We would be remiss with, to not mention the United States in World War I. Um, during the early stages of World War I, the U.S. remained neutral. All right? They had a strong tradition of uh, isolationism when it came to European affairs. The U.S. does lean toward the Allies due to severity from the barbaric actions of the Germans. So they, again, very anti-German at this moment. Uh, the U.S. traded primarily with Great Britain. Great Britain had set a naval blockade against the Germans. So the Germans, trying to evolve and trying to find ways to cause havoc, they start using a new system, uh, which is going to be the Untersee boat, the U-boats. All right, These Untersee boats are going to be uh, incredibly uh, aggressive and devastating, both for uh, naval ships and for uh, your, your luxury liners and your commercial liners that are sending supplies back and forth across the Atlantic. So on May 1st, 1915, a British luxury liner known as the Lusitania was torpedoed by a German U-boat. Um, 1,200 people were killed, including 128 Americans. This is where things started to you know, raise an alarm in the United States. The U.S. does not declare war after this sinking. A year later, on March 24th, 1916, the Sussex, which was a British passenger ferry, was struck by a U-boat as well. Over 50 people perished. Although no Americans were killed, public distaste for the Germans starts to amplify. and People are really fed up with the U-boats uh, and their actions in the Atlantic. Now, here's some images. Uh, again, U-boats, again, very stealthy, uh, very primitive. Again, the submarines, they would sink easily, and again, they would, they would run into some major technical issues, but they would be very stealthy uh, under the surface of the water, and you see the Lusitania there, which sunk uh, in an unbelievably short amount of time after being struck by a torpedo. Uh, U.S. entry into World War I. So what do we see? The Germans issue the Sussex Pledge, which states that the Germans won't attack merchant ships without warning. In February of 1917, Germany resumes unrestricted submarine warfare. This forces the U.S. to cut off diplomatic relations, to make matters even more troubling, the Zimmerman telegram is intercepted by British intelligence. What was the Zimmerman telegram? Well, again, this was a proposal by the German Foreign Secretary uh, Zimmerman. Again, the Foreign Secretary uh, is going to basically uh, offer an alliance between Mexico and Germany. The Germans, uh, excuse me, the Germans wanted an alliance with Mexico and asked them to declare war on the United States. In exchange, Mexico would reacquire. Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Remember, Spanish-American War um, and the Mexican War, tons of territory lost to the United States. Um, this led to the United States declaring war on Germany on April 6, 1917. And all of a sudden, the United States is involved. So with the U.S. now in the mix, Allied forces were able to get fresh fighters to repel German advances. However, a problem on the Eastern Front, which we're going to talk about next week, in the midst of a civil war, Russia leaves the war in 1917. Why? Because they're in full-blown revolution. The Bolsheviks, the communists, uh, are basically establishing an overthrow. And the Romanov family um, is, in, is in trouble, and there is crisis in Russia. So we're starting to see that evolve. We'll talk more about that next week. Germany is able to remobilize and go all in on the Western Front. So with Russia out of the picture, Germans are going to start going back toward France. Yet, Allied forces were able to muster a counteroffensive and push the Central Powers to the brink of surrender. And in the end, in 1918, Austria-Hungary okay, and the Ottoman Empire are going to surrender and essentially dissolve, leaving Germany on its own. Now, Germany would formally surrender on the 11th hour of the 11th day in the 11th month of 1918, so November 11th. This became Armistice Day, all right, the end of World War I. Uh, here in this country, we celebrate it as Veterans Day. But around the world, it is Armistice Day. Now, 
With the war over, Germany would endure the brunt of the responsibility of the war. This would lead to critical decisions in post-war Europe. And as you could imagine, it's a temporary Band-Aid. And again, the Germans, it's not going to take them long to uh, remobilize, and it's going to lead to even worse things as we get into the 1920s and 30s, which we're going to talk about uh, next week as well. So we're going to get into this. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. But I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for tuning in, and take care of yourselves. Bye, everybody.